Well, the reason why I was asking if uh, producer Rotten Corpse was here is because uh, he had a write-up that uh, was pretty cool over at MakeUseOf.com about the easy way to watch Netflix on Linux. Spoiler alert, really the easy way. Do you know what it is, Wes? Install Chrome. Install Chrome. How could, he, how could it be easier? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he walks through that, and then he also walks through a couple other options you have, like breaking it off into its own desktop application, and uh, the issue where it is with where it's out on Firefox and things like that. So that's really cool. So if but we actually had an email into Linux Unplugged uh, just this week that was asking how to get Netflix running again. So I thought, boy, what a great chance to mention that. And then kind of uh, great timing. Also, Joey on OMG Ubuntu has a how to watch Hulu on Ubuntu 14.04, which includes installing HAL, I guess. Uh, because Flash DRM doesn't work uh, on Ubuntu without that. So it goes through how to get that going on Ubuntu 14.04 or later. So Hulu on Linux and Netflix. Do you use Hulu? You know, only occasionally, so I'd be glad to have a guide like this. Have you read that article carefully? Have you spotted anything familiar at all in that article? Let me see. I actually just pulled it up right here. I'm noticing, let's see, I can add an Ubuntu PPA here. It's very nice. I can install. What am I missing as I... Peruse through it. Is Who's there PPA? Is it? Who's PPA? Is well, it? I noticed we're, we're, it's, we're, we're, that's actually what jumped out at me to tell you the truth. But I don't. I mean, <laughs> is uh, how do you say it? Flexion dot org. Flexion. Flexion. Yeah, Flexi- yeah, tell us about yeah. that, Wimpy. Tell us about that. That's me. Yeah. So tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. Are, yeah. are you? Uh, is this an issue that you've been working on for uh, Ubuntu Mate edition, or what is? What's going on here? What's? Yeah. Yeah. It's built into Ubuntu Mate. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. That is good. Jeez, you're good. Gosh, I love that. I love I say, that. I say it's built. I say it's built in. So actually, I found the upstream project um, some months ago. Oh, here's the credit to you right here. Very nice. Very good for good yeah. for Joey for pointing that out. Awesome. I like that. Yeah, well deserved. Yeah. yeah so um, yeah. So actually, the upstream project has done all the hard work. Mm. Um, all mm. I did was add some packaging for Debian and Ubuntu, and chuck it in a PPA. And in Ubuntu Mate Welcome, when you install Adobe Flash, it automatically pulls in that HAL Flash plugin as well, so that you get all the good stuff baked in. And what I'm currently working on is getting that into uh, the Debian archives, so then it appears in Ubuntu official archives and everyone's got access to it. That, geez, you are really making that a great out-of-the-box experience for, for regular users. That is super cool, Wimpy. And uh, but now everybody else can take advantage of it too. The secret is unleashed. Mm. Mwah, ha, ha, ha. For all of There's you who no want to watch it, I've been I've been rather um, poorly doing a job of trying to publicise this. <laughs> um, and Stuart Language has been uh, poking fun at me every time he's found the alternative methods um, in the uh, in the online press. So uh, I was very pleased that um, Joey actually did the job that was somewhere down my list of things to do, which very is good. actually write this up. Yeah. So yeah, he's done done me a favour there. Yeah, very nice. And uh, now others can take advantage of it. Maybe we'll try it out later. Yeah. This is Linux Unplugged, episode 110 for September 15th, 2015. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's just about to hit the road. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hey there, Wes. So I am all stoked to talk about today's episode. It's funny because our pre-show, we were kind of talking about online streaming, but really in today's episode, we're going to make we're going to have an emphasis on offline life like you're online. I like that. It's all the things we're used to in the modern era, but uh, without a connection. Exactly. That's my world right now. And uh, so we're going to cover a couple of really great, well, actually more than a couple of really great open source projects that help you live completely offline, but enjoy some of the perks of being online. Of course, we're also going to get into a block level backup system that is a little bit cooler than LVM snapshots. It gives you copy on write essentially to any file system. It even works with ButterFS if you want to use it with ButterFS, and it looks like it just runs in the background transparently. We're going to tell you a little bit about that coming up in the show. And then also, we've been talking about Munich and their big Linux switch and all of the news that's been coming out of that on the Linux Action Show for about three weeks now. And we're going to give the final word to our virtual lug as we say goodbye to the Munich story with uh, how they contribute upstream to open source. We'll cover that in today's episode, plus a little update on the impending roadshow and some really, really great feedback. So we have a whole bunch of stuff to get into. So before we go any further, we should probably totally bring in that mumble room. Time appropriate greetings and virtual luck. 
Pip, pip. Hello. 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 There they are. Hello, yeah. everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. Guess what? Guess what? We got to get right into it today because we have lots of stuff to cover. So uh, I want to start with the emails that have been coming to Linux Unplugged. Uh, Dow wrote in uh, with uh, a name for the road show. Here's my contribution. Love all the shows. Good luck with the endeavor. He says we should call it the Finding Linux Road Show. So in Linux Action Show, we named the, the mobile studio the JB Rover. Rover for short. Now we have to name this tour. Each roadshow will have its own name. Each tour will have its own name, so we can refer to it as that. So Dow suggests, we're going to name it, we're going to decide today in Linux Unplugged what it is. Ooh. So yeah, we're going to vote and decide. So Dow says we should name it the Finding Linux Roadshow, and that's a good idea because I do plan everywhere I go to try to find if they use Linux. Everywhere I go. So that's not bad, the Finding Linux Roadshow. That's not bad, not bad, but we have more. Hold on, hold your thoughts, because Terry writes in with a few names for the roadshow. Now get ready for these ones, Wes. The Very Open Roadshow, or Vorse for short. <laughs> the Wide Open Roadshow, or worse for short. The Linux Open Roadshow, or Linux on the Move. Okay? So those are all right, all a, right. couple, a couple of submissions there. And uh, what I'm going to suggest is, while we talk about this a little more, I'm going to submit, uh, this will be in the show notes as well, I'm going to submit this to the chat room for voting. I put them all in there. You guys go vote. I got to say, so JB Rover was the mobile studio name, but Jupiter 2 was a very common, popular suggestion. So uh, I have a poll up right now for naming the roadshow. This will go on while we do the rest of the show. And uh, chat room and mumble room, if you could vote away, I just put the link in the show notes, strawpoll.me slash 54961571. And uh, we get to vote. See if we got any votes yet. Finding Linux is uh, the Finding Linux roadshow. And Last Cribs roadshow is also up there. Uh, for voting, because remember, I'm going to Noah's house and going to do a Last Cribs episode. So uh, there you go. And then uh, one more email, kind of in this, and we'll let the votes continue. Uh, Alex wrote in asking uh, the following. He says, for the road show, I heard you might be passing by Colorado. In case that is so, it'd be great if you'd like to come by for a beer at a microbrew. Oh, cool. All right, mm. well, hold on to that thought there, Alex. But here's the second thing. He says, this week, I was at a student's meeting of Linux users at, a, at the university, and it was great to see so many people that were interested in Linux. They helped installing Mint or whoever liked to try Linux out. Some of them were even running Arch. There are around 10 to 15 people. Perhaps you'd like to meet them. They're a new generation of Linux users. So maybe I could meet them when I come back. That might be a fun thing to do. Yeah. So Alex asked uh, about uh, meeting up uh, in Colorado. And uh, Alex, so uh, right now... Uh, we, uh, we, we may actually end up going through Colorado on the return trip, but that's all a little tentative at the moment. So if you go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting, uh, we have Odyssey West right here in the mumble room. He's going to be setting up some mumble, uh, or I'm sorry, some meetups as we go along. And uh, you'll be able to see where we're at because we're going to have uh, Jupiter Bro- – we already have jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover set up. It's a live tracker of uh, the journey of, uh, of where the rover is at. So you'll be able to see what town it's at and you'll be able to tweet me or email rover at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Rover at Very Jupiter Broadcasting. Email. I love it. Yep, Rover at Jupiter Broadcasting is great for uh, trailer tips. A lot of people are, comment- are emailing in with uh, suggestions and tips for the trailer. Uh, if you want to meet up on the road, uh, we'll be checking that inbox uh, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And go to rover at jupiterbroadcasting.com. It's also on the contact page. And if you go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover, you can uh, see where the rover is in real time. Odyssey Wester is going to have access to that too, and he'll be able to set up some meetups and things like that. So meetup.com slash jupiterbroadcasting if you want to meet up along the way. Because, Alex, I think that would be really cool. I'd like that. So let's try to get that set up. So uh, let's check in with the votes one more time. Whoa, ooh, Last Cribs so Roadshow is up action. to the top. Look at that with 47% of the votes so far. Finding Linux is number two, and the Linux Open Roadshow is number three. No votes, the Wide Open Roadshow uh, and the Very Open Roadshow are getting no votes. Might be good to keep Finding Linux in your back pocket here. This one is a crib strip. Yeah, right. Yeah, Finding Linux, that's true. When oh, you're out of ideas and you want to hit the open true. road, you can just go hunt down Linux. That's true. That's you find good. It. Finding Linux could apply to a future road trip. Now, not that we should be influencing the votes, Wes. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> please, please, just disregard everything. Yeah, I'm right. Saying. That's just standing order. Yeah. So there you go. I, I'll see what happens, and then by the end of this episode, maybe we'll have a name. We'll see what. We'll see if if the votes are really super clear about it. Uh, we'll we'll see if we have a name. But I'm so this is the last Linux unplugged recording in studio. For that I will be, you'll be in studio. Yeah, but I will not be in studio starting next week. I'll be on the road, and uh, there's definitely a few things still to work out. Uh, I don't actually have all of the studio itself assembled in the RV yet, and I have um, disgusting tank issues that need to be worked out. Extra baggage, extra baggage. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's a few other things that are just really kind of 
uh, still up in the air. So it's a little crazy, and I still have, you know, uh, before I leave on Saturday, I still have uh, unfiltered, two tech snaps, and a Linux action show to record and see if I can fit in a tech talk. So it's going to be nuts. It's going to be good. It's going to be nuts. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, speaking of the road trip, and then we'll start, let's talk about Munich. Uh, I am really excited to say that right before we started the show, my first, uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to have two Ting MiFi devices, and they just sent me the C, one of the CDMA devices that I'm going to use on the road. So I'll have uh, Ting sponsored connectivity while I'm on the go, thankfully, which is going to solve a huge part of That's the problem. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really great. And, you know, right now, Ting is doing a $50 promo for the month of September. If you go to linux.ting.com, that'll support this show and give you $50 off Ting service for you. Ting is pay for what you use mobile. It's $6 a line, and then just your usage on top of that, that's how Ting works. And they have a really great dashboard, and they have no-hold customer service. And that's the core recipe of Ting. And then they really make they, they make this super, super valuable. Like, it is unbelievable with three lines. I'm paying, like, $40 a month for three smartphones. It's amazing. And the nice thing is if you need, like, a MiFi device and you just need data from time to time, Ting could be a great, great solution for you because it's just $6 for the line. And you can even suspend the line when you're not using it. Go to linux.ting.com and click on that how much you would save and put your deets in there and check them out because they've got a CDMA and GSM network. They have a lot of coverage you can choose from, and that also means there's a lot of devices you can use. In fact, very likely you might have already a Ting compatible device, in which case you'll get a $50 service credit. And they have some devices that are just absolutely unbelievable. Like right now, the Galaxy S6 is on sale. The Blue Studio 6.0 LTE is on sale. And look at the Kyocero Duro XT. I think that thing could survive like an alien attack. It's so cool. $47 for a feature phone, and the battery just lasts forever. And Noah was saying that the speaker on that thing is so loud, too, that that's a really nice feature because it's designed for construction sites. So a lot of good phones, everything from the feature phones up to the latest and greatest It's amazing devices. how many devices they support. And, you know, the Karma Go is new, and I've been looking at that Karma Go. That might be what they sent me. Ooh. I don't know. They either sent me that or uh, the uh, the Netgear unit. I'm not quite sure which one I got. To show them off on some future updates. Uh huh. Totally. Totally. Yeah. There's a great range of devices to pick from, including all the iPhone devices, the latest Android devices, and you can get that fifty dollar credit by going to linux.ting.com. Check them out. Take a read at their blog. Try their savings calculator. I think you're going to be impressed on how different a mobile company can be. It's a really cool setup, and Ting's a unique company backed by a great company, Two Cows. You're probably familiar with them. You can go to linux.ting.com to support the show and get our discount. And a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring. Linux Unplugged. Okay, so we've covered the Munich switch now for, well, for years in Linux Action Show, technically. But in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of uh, hoopla around, are, do, they, do the users want to switch away? Is it a core group of people? Oh, maybe it's just these one group of department, department users that want to switch away and some Microsoft spokespersons. And in all of this coverage, I think one of the things that came up was, holy crap, the, the Munich IT department is modifying the Linux that they're using. I mean, they have Limux and the LibreOffice they're using quite a bit, something like 40 patches to LibreOffice yeah, or something like that. a huge patch load to carry. Yeah. And a lot of people thought this was um, a, a, a big mistake. Now, one thing we did mention in the show, but I think it kind of got missed, is the patches that they're doing, they are sending upstream. That's awesome. That's yeah. the way to do it. So they, are, they consider themselves a major contributor to free and open source projects, sending bug fixes to upstream developers, making available software solutions, and sharing best practices and technical information. Now, this is true. I know that their IT folks, when, they, when some of the things they've discovered employing large sets of Linux to machines they've been sharing, uh, one of the things they say is the development cycle is long, and one of the members of the city's Linux client development team was saying that one of the reasons the wide range of computer hardware is supported, so this is one of the challenges they have, is because the development cycle of Linux and the applications they use is long, hardware changes fairly quickly. Uh, so they say, uh, whatever computer hardware was built in the last 20 years, Munich is running, and it's a central IT department, that it's central that the IT department has to support it. So they have 18,000 PCs, so you can imagine how, many hard, how much hardware breaks per day, and that's why we always stock half a year's worth of hardware. And, of course, sometimes they have to do custom patches to support some of this hardware. And some of these include, like, uh, patches for, like, scanners to do certain kinds of document scanning. Uh, they have a web-based solution to administer accounts uh, for groups, servers, and workstations with an LDAP distributed directory with information services. They have fully automated installation services to make a, a software-available updates to people, to all the workstations, over 50 uh, offices across the city. And uh, they're on the fifth version now of Limux, which isn't deployed for everybody, but it's based on Kubuntu. Uh, now, you were just recently playing with automated deployments. When you hear numbers like this, you know, you that's look at... an impressive organization. Yeah, that's 18,000 PCs, 50 offices. Uh, when you think of automating something like that, does it boggle the mind a little bit? I, it definitely does. Yeah. I can't even... I mean, you'd have to, though. You would have to. Yeah. I mean, and I can understand how they have some, some legacy needs that perhaps smaller, more nimble organizations are not buckled down with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, wanted, to, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, mention to you guys, though, 
Uh, do you guys have uh, any any takeaways from our recent Munich coverage? Anything? Any gaps that you wanted to fill in on the Munich coverage? Anybody? Because I know it's been a popular topic in our subreddit, so I wanted to open it up for discussion here in the show. Really? I got to figure somebody well, has an opinion on it. The only thing that's occurred to me, I mean, I know it's been a long time since they started this effort, but this day and age, do they need their own distribution? Could they not find a commercially supported distribution and repurpose that? Just tweak the applications that are installed and use Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or... It does sound like they're doing a lot of work to keep up with everything. Mm. It's a lot to keep in house. They're starting with Kubuntu, yeah. What? Yeah, but it's quite it's quite old, isn't it? It is, yeah. They're ba- it's, ba- it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the design of the, the only thing that I think is silly is that the design that they have of like a six year cycle between different versions. So there's at least one year they're not they're guaranteed not to get support, and they did that on purpose. Well, if you were going to do it today, wouldn't you almost do it somewhat similar, sort of as your own spin off of the distro? Like it would be. Yeah. PPAs that you lay down on top of it and things like that. Isn't that kind of how you would do it if you were going to do it today? But it would be as close to mainline Ubuntu as possible. Yeah. And yeah, I, would I think Corky makes, Corky makes a good point. They're running KDE, so why don't they base this on um, OpenSUSE? Yeah, there's you know with yeah. like the with the uh, with the studio to spin your own and and then and yeah. then the build yeah. service to build the applications and, and maybe you could have different versions for different sets of hardware if you needed. Truly, SUSE could could really the the, the 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 SUSE studio and the SUSE builds or open build service could provide a ton of infrastructure for them. Yeah, this well this isn't this the isn't this the risk when you adopt too early? Did they Okay, Wimpy, well then put very frankly, did they adopt Linux too early? Um, no, I wouldn't want to say that because somebody has to sort of take the first step and Munich have been sort of the shining light for everyone else to follow. And there have been examples of other organizations and municipalities following their lead. So I think that's all good. And I think that what's changed is that the the Linux landscape has changed a little bit since they first set out on this endeavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody had to do it. Yeah. And, and somebody had at a large scale had to do it. And it's great to see them contributing some of what they've learned about trying to, you know, hopefully the next city that adopts it will do a leaner job. What about my concern, though, that because they're kind of, I mean, I I really respect the work they're doing here, and I think it's great that they've taken this on, but isn't it also not the best example for us? Like, it because it is sort of an old style of doing implementation, it feels like every time the press goes to it every year to look at how it's doing, and they, they, we come, and the story that comes out is, well, they're struggling a little bit, but they're still chugging along. That feels like not a great. It doesn't use get case. you excited about it. Yeah, it doesn't make me want to switch my company over if I'm some CTO, right? Right. That I worry about a little bit is I'd love to see some of the companies that are out there that are huge that have switched over to Ubuntu on the desktop that just have massive deployments and they don't talk about it. And that I would really like to see because I think if more people talked about it, it's like it becomes like part of people's secret sauce. It's like it's part of their what keeps them different. I don't know what it is exactly why companies aren't talking about it, but if they would, I feel like it would feel like it was more commonplace. But yeah, like uh, Munich's what we get. Munich, What's that? Yeah, I'd like to know where uh, Munich falls on the spectrum of organizations that have really customized their installation. Right. Are there you know, are there entities out there with eighteen thousand desktops that just take Ubuntu or Red Hat out of the box? Well, we know there's Ubuntu, so we know Ubuntu's. Or I mean, we know Google is modifying Ubuntu, so. I feel like we also miss out on some of the maybe enterprise that have some Linux deployment on the desktop, you know, like maybe developers and some of the IT staff, maybe not the accountants. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure that happens quite a bit. Um, and if you watch Mr. Robot, apparently everybody runs Linux. You ever watch Mr. Robot, that show? O- only the first episode. Oh, really? Yeah, I have to catch up. Well, it's a pretty interesting show, but uh, the one thing that does seem to keep me coming back every single week is every single week they have gratuitous shots of the Linux desktop. That's beautiful. Yeah, it actually is. A Linux desktop. A, a <laughs> Linux desktop, yeah. 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 I mean, not what they say it is. Oh, I see you're running GNOME. It's not GNOME. Well, sometimes they have run they've shown GNOME, but it's mostly it looks like KDE a lot of the times. Like like I was watching episode 8 of season 1 last night and it looked like console came up Ooh. and uh, he was seeding the slash opt slash something or other. <laughs> Do they have like a Linux advisor, like uh, big studios have science advisors for their films? It seems to have, yeah. They, they do, they actually, actually, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. They have, it's impressive that they actually run commands and the stuff that it displays is 
really what it actually does. You guys, that's you, mind blowing. You guys heard us play this clip in uh, in last a uh, couple weeks ago, but I'm going to play it again anyways because uh, it's like uh, when I heard this when I heard this clip, I was like, okay, well now I have to watch that show. And I'd heard about the show, and I was like, Christian Slater, okay, that's fine. I don't have anything really against him, but not totally drawing me in. And then when I saw this clip, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to watch this show. So I see a running gnome. You know, I'm actually on KDE myself. I know this desktop environment it. is supposed to be better, but you know what they say. Old habits, they die hard. An executive running Linux? But yeah, I know what you're thinking. I'm an executive. I mean, why am I even running Linux? <laughs> it's for people who like to mess with computers. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, though. That's Thanks, such, Leo. That's such a great clip. When I saw that, I thought, wow, okay, I got to watch that show. So I don't know how we got on that topic, but if you're a Linux, it, well, you're probably listening to this show, you're probably a Linux user, and you want a television show to watch, uh, Mr. Robot's a good one. I'm, I'm stocking up on a couple of episodes for the road trip. Uh, to which I'm going to talk about a little bit on my uh, how I'm going to do some of my things offline while I'm on the road. I think it'll be an interesting challenge. Yeah, Xavier, you're welcome. Thanks for the new habit. Is anybody in the mumble room watching Mr. Robot? I watched a few of them, but not, I'm having I haven't kept up to date with it. Yeah, I I, I I keep watching him in batches, and every time I watch it, I'm glad I do. But I don't. I seem to let it go for a few weeks. How I do it? It's them. good, and it has like a little bit of things that kind of put you off for like a little bit, but then it yeah it pulls you back in with some of the tech stuff, and you're like it does. Ah. Yeah, it actually really does. Like, I, I really, I, they, the, they say some of the people that are consulting with them are actually completely anonymous. Like, they're, they're people they talk to over, like, TorChat or something. Yeah. So there you go. All right, well, uh, I, I want to get into the topic of uh, how I hope to enjoy some of the benefits of being online while offline in the trailer. Because the realities of the trailer are I'm going to be really limited on connectivity because, A, I'm either going to be on, on cellular, which will probably be, at best, limited connectivity on I-90. Um, and there's not, it's not exactly free. I mean, yes, Ting's giving to me for free, but I, you know, I don't want to abuse it. And then, uh, then if I don't have a Ting connection, then, then I'm really going to need to be self-sufficient. And so I'm trying to come up with a couple of different open source projects that I can install. I'm envisioning, so if you're familiar with how RV trailers work, Usually there's a spot where you eat, and there's a table, and there's two bench seats, and those bench seats open up. And underneath there, there's a perfect spot to set up like a NUC server and maybe like an external mirrored hard drive or something like that and put it underneath the, uh, the seat, the bench, and build a server there and then install some really nice – and I'm not doing this this trip, but I'm going to do some of these on a laptop – just to sort of test it on the drive since I have the laptop. Version 1.0. Yeah, version 1.0 is going to be on a laptop, like a beta. And I'm thinking, what couple, what different open source projects could I glue together to essentially give me an online-like experience while on the road? And there's a few major ones, uh, and that's also going to be a continuing topic in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We're going to double down and really, really focus on one really important one and show you how to set it up. But uh, first, before we get to that, I want to mention DigitalOcean, which I'm considering how DigitalOcean could be sort of like an offsite cache for me. Maybe I have uh, cron jobs on DigitalOcean that go retrieve things in one spot I pull it down, maybe when I'm on a Wi-Fi connection, something like that. So DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. So if you want to get a Linux server set up, this could be a really great way for you to spin up something really fast and try it out for two months absolutely for free. Use the promo code DO Unplugged and you get a $10 credit over at Digital ocean you can get started in less than 55 seconds and pricing plans start at only five dollars a month and for five dollars a month you get 512 megabytes of ram a 20 gigabyte ssd one cpu and a terabyte of transfer and DigitalOcean has data center locations in new york san francisco singapore amsterdam london and germany but what i really like about DigitalOcean. Well, if, uh, what I really like about DigitalOcean is that it's all running on Linux. It's all using KVM for the virtualization, and they use SSDs for all of their disk I.O. So that I really like about it. Oh, and they have Tier 1 data connections. That stuff I really like about DigitalOcean, but the thing that really makes it all sing is the interface they sit on top of it. It is a glorious interface that is really intu intuitive to easy and maybe simple. You could just call it, But I, I don't want to make it sound like it's not powerful because it is very powerful. You can do just about anything you'd want in there. And the nice thing is, is if you want to get really pro level, they got a straightforward API. So go use that promo code DO Unplugged. Try out a $5 droplet two months for absolutely free. See what I'm talking about? DigitalOcean is cray, and I have a feeling they're going to play a key role in my offline, online world. Because the DigitalOcean droplet can always be online, while the trailer cannot. DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code DOUnplugged, and try them out. 
Trust me. You can find some. Once you just try it for a little bit, it's obvious why you, you want it. You will be hooked. You will be. That's right. DigitalOcean.com and a big thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. And thanks to you guys for using promo code DO Unplugged. All right. So I want to talk about a couple of different projects that Wes and I were brainstorming that would help somebody live sort of an online life while offline. Because uh, this is going to be a key thing for me. And I thought this is probably a good, a good mental exercise to go through anyways. And one of the things I really want to do while on the road is read. I want to be able to get my reading and catch up on articles and things like this. Pocket and Instapaper are kind of like the go-to for this. And that's great if you can connect to your Instapaper queue or your Pocket queue and download them to your device. But nothing, nothing guarantees that when I decide to fire up the device, the app, on my, on my phone for the first time in two days, nothing guarantees I'm actually going to have a connection. So I would really like something that would be sort of storing the articles for me in the trailer, getting them ready to read whenever I want to, when I'm on the local trailer network. And so that's where Wallabag comes in. Wallabag is essentially an open source pocket competitor. The application is going to suck down the web page for you and store it offline for reading anytime you want. It's, it's sort of, it's, we're going to get to other ways you could do this, but this is a very Instapaper pocket kind of way. And Wes, are you familiar with Wallabag? I've tried it out a little bit on one of their older versions. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed like a great idea. I don't know how the implementation is improved. Are you using Pocket right now? I have been using Pocket. So you get the idea. I sure do. And and uh, the uh, same thing here. Like you can you can have a JavaScript bookmarklet that will send it to your queue. They have apps that you can you know for for Android where you can share to uh, Wallabag and it, it it saves it to your uh, to your local server. It's very handy. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so that's Wallabag. I don't know if anybody in the mumble room, if anybody in the mumble room has an experience with it, you feel free to jump in. But this is on my try to do list. We've talked about it once before, but it's it's pretty cool. And then something else that I gotta really come to terms with is right now I'm a really big LastPass user, but if I'm offline for an extended period of time, it might be worth looking into KeePass and maybe specifically KeePass X, because you were saying maybe I might prefer this over standard KeePass. Maybe. I, I like it a little more for native Linux implementation. Uh, if you track their Git, they have a, a I think, beta 2 now. Uh, they're using the new KeePass 2.0 format okay. uh, that has a little better, you know, if you have multiple versions, you can you know, in intermingle them. They won't conflict anymore. Uh, so it's definitely worth a try. Yeah. I found it to be So no mono stable. required seems really nice. Yes. And definitely lighter on the dependencies. It's in the AUR. Yep. So that's easy for me to get You up can download the stable release, which works, you know, very well. I've had no problems with. And yeah. then the... Uh, Version two beta, which is do you know? Well. Do you have any idea what the process is to move from LastPass to KeePass? I do not. I've actually never used LastPass, but oh, okay. KeePass Jeez. has if, been meeting all of my needs. If your issue is to have access all, when you're not online, um, LastPass actually has a thing called Yosemite or something where you download hmm. your entire vault and it's locked down on your stuff, so you can use it offline. You can use it like a portable app, or you can use it. Um, oh, it's Open Sesame. So that's what it is. Open really? Sesame. Very okay. Nice. All right. I got to yeah. Yosemite. I got to look into that. Okay. Open Sesame for KeePass. Uh, all right. Now that seems like a that so that might be a good solution for this trip. Maybe KeePass is a good long term one. Uh, yeah, I thought there was a way too. I'm a con. I'm a con in the chat room says pretty sure you can export your LastPass vault to a format. KeePass can read. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, and look at that. Odyssey says uh, here is a uh, here is uh, your LastPass vault uh, user manual for exporting. Well, cool. Thank you guys. So that might be uh, something I'll look into. Maybe not for this trip, but uh, maybe for a future one. So Wes, you were trying to convince me. I the other big thing that I want to be able to do, and I can't think of another way to do this. And I bet Wimpy's going to back you up on this. Uh, uh, you know, right now I'm I'm relying on Dropbox a lot for file sync. Yes, and I want to be able to continue to work across all of my machines. Well, which, which is really going to be three computers in the in the trailer, maybe four. And I want to be able to update files in them and have them all be able to share the files, so that way I can do show prep on the road, and then when I get a connection, have it sync back up. And I think you probably probably can't get around the fact that I mean to do that, I got to use sync thing. You got to use sync thing. I ah. mean, there are, there are some alternatives, but uh, I think sync thing works really well. Um, it runs great just on a LAN, or if you have your you know occasional connectivity to your droplet, you can mirror things up there as you as you can. Yeah, I don't know, Wimpy. What do you think? Do you think sync, this is the time sync. to switch the sync, sync thing, or can Dropbox do the job? I think Dropbox can do the job um, without without the cloud piece. Of course. Well, you only need one instance of Dropbox, don't you? You don't need all of your machines running Dropbox. You could um, have well, you could have all of your machines running Dropbox and use LAN syncing or 
you just export your Dropbox folder from one machine over NFS and mount that Dropbox That's instance true. on That's the other true. machine. That would be one way to do it, would be to have a... Because I do want to have access to all of the files on all the machines, because like, it could be notes sometimes and things like that. But if I had them all over NFS and then just had Dropbox running on the NFS server, that could be a way to do it. As long as you stay yeah. in the trailer. I don't know if you'll be... Oh, might, you know, if you go work in a coffee shop true. or you're in Noah's, you'll that's want, true. I mean, you can you can you know well, I, sync I, yourself. I often will be on the I often will be Wi-Fi hunting. Right, that's a really big component of it. But if the Dropbox, you know, the local land sync works fine, then then you'll hmm. land sync seems to only work when it actually has connectivity to the cloud server to get the master index hmm. with well, Dropbox. That, no, th- it needs it needs land sync to do the first initial upload, and then once the first initial upload of the files is done, the rest goes over the over the land. This is a challenging one. I'm not sure what to do here because it's a it's it's too big of a transition to to make before Saturday. But the more I think about it, if I want four computers to be able to all work off the same files and be able to take one of those four to a, to a coffee shop and still have all that work updated, that's gotta probably be sync thing. With maybe uh, what's the VPN uh, client? Um, oh, Tink. Yeah, with Tink. So that way, when I'm at the coffee shop, I'm connected back to the. Well, hmm. and you can have the droplet with with it too. That would be how to do it. it. Would be with the droplet. Yeah, yeah. The droplet could be in the Tink network too. Oh yeah, no problem. You oh man, you don't. The the Tink bit is optional though. You yeah, don't it's totally need optional. To tink. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking. I was thinking. Keep keep it simple, Chris. No, well, here I've, let I've me listen to a couple no. of your you know ideas, and I, I fear <laughs> that you're overcomplicating. Yeah, that's true. I'll tell you what I was thinking. Requirements. What I was thinking was it'd be nice if the trailer had Wi-Fi connectivity. To have it be able to also be getting the files, like say I'm working back here at the studio, and the trailer has Wi-Fi connectivity. It'd be nice if the changes here were already back at the trailer when I got there, if it has a persistent connection. And the only way I can really think to do that is to have the to either have like the trailer every time it connects have like dynamic DNS updated DNS record, or use Tink to just make sure it's always on the same network. I don't know. That's not again. That's not all like. A, that's not all right in this first trip, anyways. That's all. And there's com- a lot of permutations that could work there. I just think it's going to be. I think it's going on the project list, though. I think solving this. I don't know how I'm going to solve it, but this particular problem is going on the, is on that on that list. GB right. infrastructure initiative. Right. The mobile studio needs it needs a good Linux infrastructure. Uh, and then last but not least, this one is probably the one all of you were uh, guessing in the chat room. I think I might just archive some websites with wget. And it turns out, like the command, if we have the command in the show notes, it's crazy easy. There's an option in wget for our, for website archive. <laughs> So, like, we were thinking maybe we'd use ARIA2 or, uh, you know, there's a lot of different methods to pull this particular problem off. I mean, you could even just send a lot of it to Wallabag. But the nice thing about wget is it can just archive the single website. So uh, it, it, we have the command there. And uh, if you want to try it out, you can. I think I will maybe for some reading. Like, just grab a few sites, pull it down, and then read them later. Yeah, you've got all your CSS, images, everything. I could VPN to the trailer from Starbucks, says Xavier. That's exactly what I was thinking. So, uh, Mumba Room, did you guys have any other, so any other suggestions of open source projects that kind of help replicate the online experience when you're offline with no connectivity? Chris has got a real bad internet addiction, and he needs help. This is exactly it. I need, I need the slight sensation of being on the internet, even if it's just like, like a Nicorette gum. I need, I need Keep something. Keep him going on because his long journey. When, when I turn off the MiFi, right now, when I, so here's what happens right now is I have a couple of different uh, hotspot devices, depending on what signal is the strongest that morning. Uh, and then when I turn them on, all of a sudden I get a LAN, and all the devices connect, and all of a sudden they can all talk to each other and self-discover, and it's amazing. And then when I want to save bandwidth, I turn off the MiFi device, and my LAN collapses, and none of the devices have any IP addresses, and nothing can talk to itself. The dark ages. It's like, an, I'm, like they're all just individual monsters. <laughs> They're just in the dark, bumping into each other, and then I decide, okay, I want to do something online, so I turn the MiFi device back, and the, the LAN comes back online, and it feels so quiet. And it's been cool for about a week and a half or so, or whatever it's been, but today and last night, I'm kind of like, okay, I would really like to have some solid connectivity. So uh, I'm just curious what other projects you guys might suggest that I could use to kind of get that experience. If you wanted a uh, offline search type thing, you could do local search with AC. That's true. Oh yeah, that's, that's not bad one. actually. When I want to look something up but don't have connectivity, be now will AC do archiving? Because I'll have to also be able to read the the results yeah, it offline. Can. By huh. default, it doesn't. It just it does indexes, but you can make it archive too. Grab a TP link and get a USB mobile dongle. So Inagogo, you need to tell me more about that. If you would email rover at jupiterbroadcasting.com. 
uh, because uh, I'm trying to figure out how the NUC, so the NUC is also going to be my firewall, I assume, and I need to know how that NUC is going to jump between different uh, or, uh, cellular connections for the LAN. Wimby, do you have any input on uh, Wi-Fi and uh, things like that in an RV? Yeah, so I've, I think um, I've got what we would call over here an SUV, which I think is more or less the same kind of thing. Okay. And I've got um, wireless and Ethernet <clears throat> in mine. And um, I used one of these uh, travel um, routers, you know, so it's battery packed router uh, and a wireless N and it's got a USB port on it that I plug a 3G, 4G USB dongle into. So that device, that, that router uses the 3G, 4G to get an internet connection and provides the LAN and it Perfect. has one, one ethernet port so I can have one hardwired device, not that I ever use it. So I could plug that into the NUC, for example. For example, yeah. yeah. And um, that way, when you don't want internet connectivity, but you do want the LAN, you simply unplug the USB dongle and you retain your LAN, but you've physically, <laughs> physically removed yourself from the internet. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. That and that's exactly got right. that you know that's got caching DNS and all of that stuff on it and DHCP. Ooh, so, Ooh okay, you know, all right, okay. So, do you have a link a to Zoom. that one? I'll look it up and post it in the IRC. Perfect. In a second. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the I, ever resourceful mumble room. You that's suggested uh, MPD. Oh, yeah, that would be one option. And I was thinking, what was the? Anybody remember the alternative to, to Subsonic? What was that? Remember how there's a Subrage or something like that? There was a. There's an alternative to Subsonic that's come out recently that would also possibly it's kind of like replace that would basically be replacing Spotify. Yes. Um, but other than that, that was kind of where I was starting to kind of. Uh, I mean, I have a couple ideas that I'm saving for last that are huge. But other than that, that's kind of what I've come up with. So if you go to LinuxActionShow.reddit.com in the subreddit and look for episode 110 and give me your ideas for open source projects that give you that online experience while you're offline. And the thing I love about this is it's not. It's Mad Sonic. Yeah, that's what it was. Thank you, guys. Mad Sonic. The thing I love about this idea, it's not just for those of us that are living on uh, metered cellular connections, uh, but it's also great for just that whole bringing things offline again, moving things out of the cloud and bringing it back on your own LAN or your own droplet or what or whatever. Oh, Wimby, did you find it? Better good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoomtel.com. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's I nice. Have, I have the 4506 AG. Okay, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for people that are looking for something similar out there. So that is and perfect. It's, so it runs off, um, I don't know if you have them in the US, but we have what used to be called cigarette lighters, but they're now just used to power stuff. Yeah, that's what I use so, in the trailer, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so it runs off a, a cigarette lighter, but the router has a battery pack in it. That's perfect. So when, so when it comes off the power, it's charged and it runs for a few hours off its own battery. So it's the travel, nice. it's the travel one that you have? Yeah, I have the 4506 AG, the travel router that is, wireless end. You sold me you sold me with the DC power connector, to be honest with you. Because this yeah, is that, the, the, the so, I need everything to run off of DC. I don't even know if you can make a NUC run off of DC power, but if you can, I need it to. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Staples yeah, sells them. That. Perfect. But what you will what you will need is a USB, a compatible uh, USB. Uh, dongle right. and they've got a detailed they've got a detailed list of you okay. know what the compatible options are okay. and they have the I, I bought mine on Amazon and it, it had the option to buy the car kit the car kit yeah I'm looking at it right now on Amazon very good yeah yeah oh man maybe this is probably exactly what I needed Jeez, it's only what did you what how can it only be thirty dollars yeah it's as cheap as yeah holy crap holy crap that's great yeah, I think I'm gonna. Uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna put this on the uh, on the list for something to look into after this trip. Because that could be. I could, I, uh, now you don't have the ability to hook up to like a, an Ethernet connection on the WAN side, do you? You can use WAN on the Ethernet side. You can either use it as LAN or WAN. It's a selectable thing in the UI. Oh. So when I'm when I when I have the trailer parked here at the studio, I could run Ethernet out to the to the trailer network. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, that is so exciting! I'm putting that on the list right now, man. Thank you, perfect. That's exactly and what you I can plug right into Noah's network. And... Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, 
and then uh, have the and then I'll have the NUC sitting behind that, so that way the the LAN's IP address and and DNS always stays the same or something. I mean, I don't know. That could be, yeah, cool. Yeah, oh, that's does, great. It does port address translation and UPnP and all that stuff. So, so uh, yeah, there you go. So um, uh, forty. Do you say you have the forty five oh six A or which one? I'm looking. Which yeah, yeah. four five AG. oh six AG. AG. Yeah. yeah. Okay. AG. Well, geez, that's great, Wimpy. Good pick. So I'll have to make sure I put the right one on my on my list. Uh, all right. Any anybody else have any other suggestions for replicating online experience? NUC does need DC input, so it might be possible to get the NUC to do that. Huh. Very cool. All right. Well, if you have any suggestions when you're listening, uh, oh look at that! Well, look what Rikai just found. Uh, you can use any. Oh, that is so awesome! You do not need a DC to DC converter. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. So it looks like other people have already had this same thought process. That's why it's the next unit of computing. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That is so cool. That is so awesome. 12 volts, 36 watts. Hmm. That's, that's amazing. That means I could run the NUC off of total battery power that's charged by solar panel. Ooh. The home land on the trailer would be run off of a solar panel. It's just, okay, I'm just going to absorb that for a moment. I'm going to sit with that for a second. And now I think I'm going to tell you. Oh, oh, go ahead, Wimpy. Yeah, another one. The 4506. That's the list of compatible USB oh, adapter uh, USB. That's probably models. good to have too. I will also add the link to, to that in the show notes, so that way we all have that. Because I'll I'll probably come back to this episode to look for it myself when I'm ready to make the purchase. So that's cool. Um, all right. So now I have been looking at different ways to do backup for some of our production machines, and it's not just because I love rolling releases that I want to find a really <laughs> good backup, but that might be part of what's niggling at the back of my mind. Uh, so, uh, I have been looking at a kind of a slick way to do a, um, a real easy snapshot and restore system that doesn't take up a whole bunch of storage space, doesn't require like a blank dedicated volume, um, and, uh, doesn't require a specialized file system that I'm not completely comfortable using yet. And so I'm going to tell you about that. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Linux Academy because you can check them out and maybe take your skill sets up to the next level. They're sponsors of the Linux Unplugged program. I want you to go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged gets you our special 33% discount. Now, what does Linux Academy have? Well, it's a training grounds full of stuff based around Linux and open source. Self-paced courses, over 1,800 videos. They have scenario-based labs so you get real hands-on training with it. I think it was probably early 2004, 2005, I decided to go into a community college to get training. Not nearly as efficient as this. This what, Now, like, the, the concept of going in a few nights a week, how do people have time to do that? I don't know. I don't know how they do that, to be honest with you. See, Linux Academy, not only uh, is it all self-paced, and so you can just go at it with, with, at your own time availability, but if you really want to get specific about it, they have time availability at selectors. So you can go in there and say, okay, on Monday I have this much time, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday I have this much time, Saturday I'm taking a break, Sunday I'm taking a break, right? Or whatever you want to do, or maybe you want to do it only on the weekends. You tell Linux Academy how much time you have, and they automatically generate courseware that matches your availability, including you know reminders for exams, Things like that. They have seven plus Linux distributions you get to choose from. They automatically adjust the courseware. They have them cool nuggets, and they've just recently updated the nuggets too. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, these might be some nuggets that are worth your time. So these nuggets are like two to 60 minutes, just a deep dive into a specific course. Aliases and escapes in Bash. You know you could be saving time with better aliases. The comma is your friend in Bash. Command history shortcuts in Bash. Those are all extremely useful nuggets. You just go in there right there and get it. Uh, alternative command line for the email, privacy, web browsing with privacy badger, manipulating logs with sed, dig for DNS, user key loggers, Linux signals, a short tutorial. That's a great one. Check them out. You can go to linuxacademy.com slash nuggets, but start by going to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And also, if you're interested in doing some training or writing some practice, practice exams or maybe you want to do some back-end work for Linux Academy, they're hiring. You can email them career at linuxacademy.com. So go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And if you want to get a gig, career at linuxacademy.com. Big thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Okay. So, Wes, it's called, I think, I'm going to say Datto Block Driver. D-A-T-T-O. Datto. Datto. It's a Datto Block Driver. Now, here's how they set it up. 
Now, they recognize, and I like this, they build the case, that Linux has some basic tools for creating snapshots of file systems. Most use copy-on-write schemes to allow point-in-time consistent snapshots. Currently, both LVM and Device Mapper, on which LVM is built, support copy-on-write snapshotting. Unfortunately, both have limitations that render them unusable for supporting live server snapshotting across desperate Linux environments. For example, LVM snapshotting requires an unused volume in order to track your copy-on-write data. So, enter... The Datto block driver, Datto BD. It solves the above problems. It is an open source Linux kernel module for a point in time live snapshotting. Datto BD can be loaded onto a running Linux machine without reboot and used to create an image file representing any block device at the instant the snapshot was taken. After the first snapshot, Datto B tracks incremental changes to the block device and can therefore efficiently update existing backups by copying only the blocks that have changed. With a single command, DB can almost instantly create a point-in-time snapshot device representing the snapshot state. Between snapshots, disk writes are tracked, so incremental changes can be quickly and efficiently applied to an existing image file. DB is designed to run on any Linux device from small test virtual machines to live production servers with minimal impact on I.O. or CPU performance. Since the driver works at the block layer, it supports the most common file systems, including extended, XFS, and even ZFS and Butterfs. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Maybe I should make sure I double-read this. Although file systems with their own block device management, such as ZFS and Butterfs, cannot be supported. Oh, misspoke. So Butterfs is not supported. Kind of a bummer, but I guess not necessary since Butterfs has copy-on-write support in itself. All copyright, uh, uh, copy-on-write data is tracked in a file on the source block device itself, eliminating the need to have space volume, uh, space a spare volume in order with the space of a spare volume in order to store that snapshot. So, in summary, DataDB brings functionality of similar to like volume shadow copy on Windows uh, to a broad range of Linux install installs, file systems, and kernels. Are you impressed at all, Wes? I'm very curious. You know, they say efficiently. I'm interested in what the overhead might be. Um, it'd be very, it'd be very fun to try this on some running systems and see what happens. All right. So, let's put it to the mumble room. Is anybody in the mumble room? Now remember, Chris is going to be on the road next week, and it would be great if we all met back here for 111 with a real good like story. Is anybody in the mumble room willing to try this out? You could do it on a virtual machine or an actual machine this week and report back next week on how it went. Anybody? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. Oh, I love it! Oh, that was easy yeah. enough. <laughs> So uh, I'll have it linked in the show notes. Wimpy, I'm just really curious, you know, uh, if it really can easily... I don't know, like maybe the test would be update a system and see if it's easy to go back or recover recover data exactly how it works. Could be kind of yeah. neat. Well I've got I've got a machine here that I'm using as my main workstation, which I'm about to upgrade, so I don't really mind if it goes horribly wrong. So I ah, think what I'll do perfect. is do some backups, do some updates and do some backups and roll back, <laughs> and then I'll do a full distribution upgrade and try and roll back and see what happens. Oh, I can't wait. I'm really excited. This is exciting, yeah. <laughs> So, Datto block driver, D-A-T-T-O, Datto. Uh, oh, very neat. Uh, it's, uh, they got me when they said uh, that uh, it, it makes it super fast to do incremental updates because that made me think that, you know, once you get the first one done, then it's not really that much of a tax to, to fire off a quick one before you do an update or something like that. And, and I love the idea that you could just plug it, you know, add this to a running system. Oh, yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't use a copy on write file True. system, but I'd really love to be able to, you know, especially True. if you're running a rolling release. And especially if, you know, you don't really, you know, you have a system where extended 4 is just fine for you. Something like that. And uh, speaking of extended 4, did you guys see that the next kernel update is going to drop extended 3 support? Or at least the explicit driver. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is that what it is? Not the support for it. Okay. Okay. So it'll, it'll still be there if somebody has extended 3. Well, it'll yeah. load it. With like a module type. Yeah, exactly. A extended 4 now will be the extended 3 support. Right, yeah, because it can read it too. That's interesting, so it's not really a big deal at all. Not really it's an interesting all. discussion, even if, it, even if you didn't have it, like, who cares? Yeah, it is an interesting like, discussion. And, this, used it. and the, uh, the mailing, if you look at the mailing list. Yeah, and how they kind of go through and decide, like, uh, you know, the thought process behind it, what's it going to break, do we really want to run this risk, and okay, well, if we have the backwards compatibility here and we can module it, uh, so... Corky says that Linus blocked it. He he did. Uh, it looked like, at least on the mailing list, that then there was further discuss discussion. Yeah, that's what I thought. In the file system development, that yeah. they are willing to say that the ext4 as of today actually right? does not enforce new features, so that you could, if you had an ext3, then you use the ext4 driver and wanted to go back to a kernel 
just using the ext3 driver right it would still work and right. they were willing to support that that's my understanding and i think i read that today or yesterday so it's pretty recent corky if you maybe missed it but it doesn't really affect anybody that's running extended three the other thing that was interesting is that it points out that they're keeping or probably keeping ext2 just because it's a really good example file system so maybe anyone interested in mm. linux kernel development or file system development that's a good one to go study it's simple but effective yeah Huh, that is interesting. And if you wanted to implement a new file system, there's a skeleton you can use. Start with something, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it has. it's pretty It's pretty road-proven, as, as I say, because I'm thinking about road trips, you know. It's very important. Yeah. All right, well, that'll bring us, uh, well, at least towards the end of this week's episode of uh, Linux Unplugged. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm, really, I'm really actually pretty happy. We had a really good turnout um, for what is sort of universally known in, like, the news business as the slowest weeks of, like, this um, starting, you know, a couple of weeks ago till now is like in the U.S. Like our Congress goes on vacation, like the news people go on vacation. Anderson Cooper goes on vacation. Yes, even Anderson Cooper goes on vacation. Oh my gosh, it's Anderson <laughs> Cooper, everybody! Megan Kelly goes on vacation, but not the Mumble Room. The Mumble Room still showed up, and uh, you guys I, are troopers. You guys really are. I hope you uh, will show up next week. I have no idea what my connection is going to be like. But uh, it'll be fun, guys. Yeah, I'll also be remote. I'll be remote with you. But if all goes as planned, my audio is going to be recorded locally. Ham radio will be slapping it all together, delivering to Rekai for video production. And hopefully it'll still sound pretty good, even though I'm on the road. That's the goal. The live show, you'll hear me on the remote connection. But in the downloaded version, I should sound pretty good. That is the intention, at least. We'll see how that goes. You'll find out in episode 100 and 11. Join us on uh, Sunday's episode of the Linux Action Show. I'm going to take this topic of enjoying online life while you're offline, and I'm going to zoom into an open source project that needs way more attention. Wes turned me on to it a few weeks ago, and um, I think a lot of people are going to be talking about it after we talk about Linux Action Show. I think show. Some, there's already some people in the yeah. IRC yeah. I've seen yeah. using it, yeah. so I, this I, will I be good. Don't spoil it, dude, but it's, I'm really excited. And uh, Noah and I have been using it uh, for a little bit, so that way we can give you our impressions on it after a couple of weeks of marinating. So, and it fits in so perfect with our topic today. So, if this at all it was an interest to you and you want to deep dive into something, check out Sunday's episode. Oh, actually, I keep saying Sunday, but I think we're recording on Friday. That way we can record it while I'm still in town. So, we'll be live on Friday for Linux Action Show for release on Sunday for download. All right. Well, that right there will bring us to the end of this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We should be live next week at our regular time. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. If you want to suggest an offline open source project, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Look for the 110 feedback thread. Or you can email us at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. I got a magical drop down right there. It's incredible. It's great. Also, don't forget jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover to follow the uh, road trip as it's live and rover at jupiterbroadcasting.com to email anything about the road trip. All right, Wes. Well, I will talk to you from afar next week. Ooh, this will be fun. Mm. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for tuning in this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. And we'll see you right back here next week. Look at that. Wimpy says he knows one of the guys that works at Datto. Really, Wimpy? That's interesting. Tell me more about that. I know, well, I didn't realize until I started looking through the GitHub. Huh. Um, his, his name's Dan Fury, and he did some work um, in Arch a little while ago. And um, I took on some packages that he'd been maintaining in the AUR. Um, he, he'd, he'd been uh, doing some work on Compis. And I've just I just thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> that username looks familiar. Oh, that's yeah, great. So he's the guy pushing the source. And in in the same um, GitHub account, they've got um, a PDF which goes into some detail about how how this all works. Very cool, nice nice it's, spot. It's the, ba it's the basis of a commercial product. Um, so dat datobackup.com. Mm, interesting. So although so although the code has only landed in GitHub about a month ago, this appears to be battle tested. It's uh, I was, in production. I, I heard about it. I was I was emailed in. Somebody said this. So I've been using this for a little bit, and uh, I thought and, yeah. and I thought okay, well that's interesting. Let's take a so, look at it. Dato.com 
is products built around this solution. Fascinating. Look at that. So, yeah, that's nice that it has a commercial backing. It's battle-tested. JBTitles.com, also last chance to vote on the Roadshow name. Right now, Last Cribs Roadshow is currently winning with 42% of the votes. Finding Linux coming up number two. On titles, we have Linux Unhitched and Last Cribs Trip. I don't know. Keeping Linux online. Going offline. Hmm. No place like Slash Home. Uh, classic. No place like Slash Home. That's true. That's not bad. Feel like we could do something more around the going offline thing. Uh, yes. So, what do you think? JBTablets.com. Last chance to vote. Anything grabbing you there, Wes? You like any? Do you like any of those in particular? Well, let me take a look. Yeah, yeah, you take a look. So that's so is that data? Is that was a big NAS they had there? That's interesting. I wonder if they sell it to NAS oh, creators. Yeah. <clears throat> They've got some cloud to cup solutions as well. No, no place like Tilda. Um, keeping Linux online. I don't know. I feel like something Linux offline. Used by Evernote. How I to f- download the internet? That's almost there. Going offline almost sounds like the show's ending. I don't know if I like that idea. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Linux unhitched is close. Yeah, it's close, but not quite it. Uh, Linux hits the roads, not quite it, because that feels like that could be next Linux week's episode. Plug disconnects. That could be next week's episode title too, though. Yeah. Ah, oh, this is close. How about live online like live live on live? Okay, live offline like you're online. Is that too long? Is that dumb? Um, offline oddities. Linux unplugged unplugs the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Linux unplugged gets <laughs> away. <laughs> uh. Jeez, how? Why? This should not be this hard. This should not be this hard. Uh, all right, so uh, hold on real quick. Let's see, let's just like focus in here. We can do this. We can do this, you guys. We can do this. I have faith. And the value of this is negative. That's awful. All right, well, there's no place like Slash Home's not bad, but I could break the internet too. Uh, let's see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Offline online solutions. Offline o- action show. <laughs> offline online solutions, kind of funny. I kind of feel like Linux living. Uh, oh, that's a little weird. Never mind. I kind of feel like maybe there's no place like Slash Home's the way to go. Is that awful? Oh my gosh, we've got to find something! We've got to find something! What about no place like uh, (laughs) 127.0.0.1? Yeah, that's not bad either. That's not bad either. Uh, Offline online solutions, offline action show, Linux hits the road... Why is this so hard? I think that we should all make those businesses fail. Dang it, RMS, you're just distracting me. I'm bringing off down the, the economy. Icarus says off the grid. That's pretty good. Linux off the grid? What is it? Uh, what is it? He said off the grid in the RV, but I just tweak that and make it something like, uh, I don't know. Linux living Linux offline. Yeah. Return of the local host. I like that, Shadow7. Return of the local host isn't bad. Off grid Linux. So I think I, Linux living li, Linux living offline, or what was the other one? The most recent one. Yeah, the one you just said. Return of the local host. So I think that's the return of the local host or living Linux offline. Which one do you guys like better? Wouldn't it be better if return of the local host was re- used when you returned and were a local host? <laughs> oh. Okay. If we can remember. If we can remember. Uh, living Linux offline. Living Linux offline. Is that good? What do you think of that? You don't, you're not liking it? It's okay. Okay. No. Damn I'm, not, I'm not vetoing. No, but you don't, you're, not, you're not jazzed goes up. off the grid. Huh? Linux goes, goes off. off the grid. Yeah. Look, look your off old the man grid. voice there. Huh? What'd you say? What'd you say? What was it? Come, ag- come again. Uh, gosh dang it, you guys. Gosh dang it. Gosh dang it. This is too tough. All right, here we go. This this is it. This is it. This is it right here. No take bags. Okay. 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 I kind of think return of the local host just because uh, we probably won't remember to use it when I get back. We'll probably, yeah, we are the a, worst. There's a, so. there's a thing I could just I save think it. I could remember. I don't know. I feel like I feel like if we if we hold on to it, I think no. I, I feel like we should use Google it. Google Calendar. 
No, it's not. It's not that much solved. worth it. I think we are so. We need a good title right now. I I say we can come up with another. I have faith. Faith of the heart. I've got faith that we can make it up again. Uh, surviving offline is a real goof. Is real good. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a typo. It's real good. Okay, that's it. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> the one little difference that makes. Thanks, the anime. All right, thanks, you guys. I think we're all done here.